Chapter 32, The Politics of Boom and Bust, 1920-1932. Let's get started. So first of all, after the war, I think we said last chapter uh, that we have a desire to return to normalcy. That's certainly how Warren G. Harding phrases it in part of his campaign promise. Uh, but that includes this big business sort of mentality. Uh, government's going to favor and support big business. In fact, we see some changes to traditional laissez-faire economics, and that leads to tremendous economic growth. And then obviously at the end of the decade, uh, something quite the opposite of that. Isolationism does resume. However, there is a real effort to promote a lasting peace in this post-war era. And unfortunately for Herbert Hoover in his own day, and even today, some folks still blame him for the Depression. And they cite his sort of do-nothing, rugged individualism kind of mentality. Uh, but he does lay the groundwork for what will become sort of this whole New Deal approach. We could pretty much sit here all day and, and speak ill of uh, Warren G. Harding if we wanted to, but we're not going to do that. Let's just be brief and summarize the fact that he was not a good president. Uh, I don't think he was incompetent per se, but he was not of presidential standard. He didn't make decisions all that well. He was easily swayed. Uh, he was afraid of hurting people's opinions. Um, I think he just, just couldn't handle the stress and rigor of what it is to be the president. Uh, and unfortunately for him, he's kind of one of the boys, and so he appoints this Ohio gang to his cabinet, right? These are friends of his who probably had a big role in choosing him as presidential candidate, but they include some folks who helped him out, like Charles Evan Hughes, as Secretary of State, and Andrew Mellon, as Secretary of Treasury, and Herbert Hoover, who was Secretary of Commerce, and obviously former head of the Food Administration and uh, future president. But he had some other folks on his staff that were not exactly helping him, including Senator Albert B. Fall, who's Secretary of Interior involved with in the Teapot Dome scandal, and Harry M. Doherty, who was the Attorney General and, according to the pageant, a flat-out crook. And here's the president's cabinet, the Ohio gang, with Warren G. Harding at the head of the table, and to his right, Secretary of State Charles Evan Hughes. The pageant says there's a new form of laissez-faire, and rather than just being hands-free, the government will be sort of a guiding hand for business. And in fact, they'll stop legislating as much and help uh, try to help business actually make profit. In the early years, the 1920s, the Supreme Court ruled in Atkins v. Children's Hospital that women did not deserve special protection in the workplace. In fact, they cited the 19th Amendment and said that it made women the legal equals of men and therefore shouldn't get special privileges. This is just an attempt at striking down some of this progressive legislation that could be seen as impeding economic growth. Uh, antitrust laws will just not be used as they once were. Corporations under President Harding could expand without worries of antitrust laws. And the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was really the, the first bit of economic regulation, right, interstate regulation at least, uh, was actually led by men who were sympathetic to the managers of railroads. Think back to the control of the economy that the federal government had during World War One, and know that they give it all up after the war. That's the point here. And so we'll look at some examples of that. The Esch Cummins Transportation Act, as you can see, uh, re-privatized railroads. In fact, it also pledged the Interstate Commerce Commission to guarantee the railroad profitability. The Merchant Marine Act, 1920, authorized the government to sell its wartime fleet of 1,500 vessels at very low prices, so the, the these ships can be used in, in need in a time of war, but the government will not be in control of the shipping business. Labor had protection during the war with the National War Labor Board, uh, which did try to prevent strikes and promote um, better conditions for the working folks. Uh, however, after the war, uh, that's not going to be the case any longer. You can see in 1919 there was a major strike in the steel industry, and it was ruthlessly broken, the pageant tells us. Here's the flag of the Merchant Marine. And for a bonus point, whoever is the first to sing the chorus to this classic Jimmy Buffett song, Son of a Son of a Sailor, you get a bonus point. In 1921, Congress created the Veterans Bureau to operate hospitals and provide vocational rehabilitation for the disabled. The American Legion was created in 1919 by Colonel Teddy Roosevelt Jr. It's Teddy Roosevelt's eldest son, excuse me. Uh, and it's a support and social group for veterans. Obviously, it still exists today. Um, they convinced Congress in 1924 to pass the Adjusted Compensation Act, which gave every former soldier uh, sort of a, an insurance policy. And it was supposed to be paid in 20 years. Um, this was actually passed over Calvin Coolidge's veto. They did attempt this in 1921. It was vetoed. And then it came back in 24. We'll see this bonus army march on the Capitol towards the end of this chapter. 
Now remember that the United States did not actually sign the Treaty of Versailles, and because of that, they have to kind of figure out their own peace agreement with Germany and the other members of the Central Powers. And Congress will um, pass a joint resolution in July of 1921 to officially end the war for the USA. And as I said earlier, that that brings about a return to isolationism. Um, President Harding didn't like the League of Nations like many other people, and at first he refused to support the League's World Health Program. Uh, Secretary Hughes secured the rights for American oil companies to share oil lands in the Middle East with Britain. But uh, what we need to know is that this Washington Disarmament Conference or Washington Naval Conference 1921 and 1922 is going to bring about several treaties that are trying to promote uh, peace, uh, lasting peace or a genuine peace. And it's really built around disarmament and respecting one another's possessions. So these three treaties are the Five Power Naval Treaty, the Four Power Treaty, and the Nine Power Treaty. And I'll go through them individually. And so the Five Power Treaty is about disarmament, specifically naval disarmament, and you can see that it really focuses on larger war vessels. Uh, it does not really have any restrictions on cruisers, destroyers, and submarines, and it said in the pageant that basically countries were building as many of those as they could while adhering to the restrictions in the Five Power Treaty. But as you can see, this reduction comes with this ratio that's maintained, and the United States and Britain will have the... Uh, largest proportional amount of war vessels and Japanese obviously are next and you can see that France and Italy follow and it said in the pageant that the Japanese were very offended by this. There's also a clause in there about non-fortification of American and British possessions in the Pacific including the Philippines obviously. The Nine Power Treaty is more about the open door policy in China and recognizing Chinese sovereignty. And the Four Power Treaty between Britain, Japan, France, and the U.S. will replace the 20-year-old Anglo-Japanese Treaty, and it preserved the status quo in the Pacific. In 1928, there's an attempt to outlaw war, and so the Kellogg-Brand Pact is what it was referred to in the United States. It was also known as the Pact of Paris. It was ratified by 62 nations. And it said that you can't use war as a means to forward your national agenda, your national goals. But it did permit defensive wars, so one could very easily spin it and say that they're fighting a defensive war. Also, doesn't really say what you can do or can't do to punish a country that violates that law. So it kind of is a, is a moot point, but certainly is a nice effort towards a lasting peace. And obviously it's a reaction to this colossal scale of World War I. Folks, we're 32 chapters in. You know that the Republicans want to raise the tariff, and that's what they do here with the Ford and McCumber Tariff 1922. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, the Europeans, because they can't sell their goods to the United States, are going to counter. Uh, they'll just have their own tariff, and therefore trade between the two nations will be reduced significantly. And that's never a good thing. We want to have money changing hands. We'll come back to this point a little later in the presentation. All right, tough to have a bad presidential administration without some good old-fashioned scandal, right? In 1923, Colonel Charles R. Forbes was caught stealing $200 million from the government, largely in the building of veterans' hospitals. The scandal that you're going to want to know about is the Teapot Dome scandal in 1921. Here, the Secretary of Interior, Albert B. Fall, was able to convince the Secretary of the Navy to transfer valuable oil land to the Interior Department, and Harding did okay this. He did sign off on that. Uh, but after that happened, Albert Fall was illegally leasing that public land to a couple of oil men, and he took a significant amount of bribes in return for that. Also, Attorney General Doherty was accused of illegally selling pardons as well as liquor permits. And again, his job is to prosecute the bad guys, and clearly he is a crook. Here is that Teapot Dome um, rock formation in Wyoming. I'm not sure that I see it. Maybe you do. I kind of see an elephant. And here's a cartoon that we can hip in class. All right, so unfortunately for Warren G. Harding, he does die in August 1923 in pneumonia and thrombosis, which is a blood clotting issue. Vice President Calvin Coolidge will take over, and he is, they say, very shy and quite boring. He's from Vermont. They said he's nasally. 
they they said he was weaned on a pickle for crying out loud. So um, I think they call him Silent Cal for a reason. But he does continue Harding's business friendly policy. And here he is, the great Vermonter. So at the end of the war, farms begin to struggle again because the federal government is not buying crops and not guaranteeing high prices. And other nations now are going to be producing crops of their own and competing on the world market. In addition to that, a surplus of crops is going to develop because of this heavy use of machinery. Modern machinery, you know, the tractor allowed the farmer to plow more land while sitting down than his uh, earlier counterpart who had to rely on animal power to do the same thing. There were some efforts to help farmers, including the Capra Volstead Act, which exempted farmers marketing co-ops from antitrust prosecution. But the McNary Hagen bill uh, will actually be vetoed. It tried to keep agricultural prices high by authorizing the government to buy crop surpluses and then sell them abroad. I think once prices increased again, this would have cost the government way too much money. And as I said, Coolidge vetoed it. All right, if you recall the previous chapter, we actually listed basically all of these conflicts that you see here as conflicts that existed without the or throughout the 1920s. And the Democratic Party in 1924 was split along those lines. So you can read those to yourself if you'd like to. But again, it's sort of like this, this new wave of Democrats versus a more traditional view of what America should be or what American culture should be. Democrats eventually choose John W. Davis as their candidate, and the Republicans will rerun Calvin Coolidge. And a new progressive party will emerge under the leadership of Robert La Follette. At least he's their candidate. And they did have some pretty important groups behind them. They had the American Federation of Labor, right, a very large um, union of skilled labor. They have sort of this dying socialist party behind them. And they've got these uh, farmers who are really struggling, continue to struggle, I should say, in the Midwest and West. And some of the things they support there, you can see national railroads, nationalized railroads, excuse me, as well as relief for farmers. And they're opposed to monopolies and anti-labor injunctions. They also support a constitutional amendment to limit the Supreme Court's power to invalidate laws that are passed by Congress. But you can see from the map here, well, first of all, Bob LaFollette wins his home state only in Wisconsin. But you can see that the Republicans do have continued support. And in fact, it's a pretty sweeping victory for Calvin Coolidge. American foreign policy throughout the 1920s is rooted in isolationism. However, there are some examples in Latin America where that's not quite the case. And I would, I would guess that's a continuation of those Monroe Doctrine sort of principles, uh, but you'll see military personnel deployed to Haiti and Nicaragua. We'll see concern over Mexico declaring control over their own oil resources, although Coolidge will use uh, diplomacy to handle that situation. Something that may seem economic, but it's not purely economic, is the fact that the United States prior to the war was a debtor nation and after the war emerges as a creditor nation. So that changes our role globally and it changes uh, perhaps the relationship, you could say, between the United States and its chief allies. Uh, unfortunately for those allies, the United States demanded they pay back the $10 billion we loaned them. And specifically, Great Britain and France are going to look at this and, and kind of be offended. And they're going to say that the U.S. should write these off as war costs. Uh, after all, the Britain and France did, you know, spend a lot more in terms of lives on the battlefield. And shouldn't the United States sort of excuse this debt? Um, and that's just not the way the United States wants to see it go down. In addition to that, there's that tariff that I mentioned before. So even if Europeans wanted to pay back the money that they owed us, they're having a hard time selling their goods to Americans, and therefore they're making less money and therefore are less able to pay off that debt. There is another obstacle to the English and French actually paying back the debt they owe to the United States, and that is that they're waiting on payment from Germany. Germany was charged $36 billion in reparations as part of the Treaty of Versailles. And there is hyperinflation that's happening in Germany. I mean, the economic situation in Europe is, is not great in general, but it was really bad in Germany. And so they're not able to pay at all. A solution uh, by a banker, Charles Dawes, in 1924, is a cycle of payments. Um, and basically it allows Americans to make private loans to Germany. 
the Germans could then use those loans to pay back reparations, which the Allies could then use to pay off the war debt that they owed to the Americans. Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I understand that, but it's based on American credit, which was actually quite easy to get, I suppose, in the middle of the 1920s. Obviously, that dries up at the end of the decade, and again, there's sort of a halt of payments globally, not just related to this war debt. Here's a diagram showing that cycle of payments that is going to be called the Dawes Plan. And here are some nice Germans, uh, children playing with stacks of Deutschmarks. So you can see hyperinflation. These is basically worthless paper. And this man here with the wheelbarrow bought himself a pack of gum. Calvin Coolidge announced he would not run again in 1928, and the Republicans chose Herbert Hoover. Uh, he was well-liked. Again, remember, you know at the end of his presidency, he's not well-liked. But going into it, he was thought of as being um, a good leader. And in fact, they said he had a sound integrity. He was humanitarian. Uh, he was efficient. Uh, he could inspire people. And he favored a lot of traditional Republican things, including isolationism, individualism, free enterprise, and small government. So he had a lot going for him. He also was running against Al Smith, who was a governor of New York, uh, and also a Catholic. And you have to realize that that was a real barrier in this you know, Protestant-dominated country in 1928. Um, people really genuinely feared that the Pope would somehow infiltrate the presidency and be kind of pulling the strings behind the curtain. Uh, the radio was widely used in this campaign, and that did not help Al Smith. The book talked about his... Uh, accent and how that came across on the radio, sort of unpresidential. Uh, and I think Herbert Hoover was a bit more polished, and so that certainly helped him. Here is the campaign map, and you can see a lot of red on that map, and so Herbert Hoover is going to be successful in this election. Al Smith, though, he didn't lose a beat, right? Here he is playing golf with Babe Ruth, so not only does he miss the Great Depression, lucky him, he gets to play uh, around a golf with a salt and a swat here. Those pants, by the way, are called knickers, and they were in style, um, for golf at least. Al Smith is not wearing them, he just, they're regular pants pulled up to his chest. Right, President Hoover's first move, uh, he's going to try to help out these disorganized wage earners and disorganized farmers. Uh, they're not having the success that big business and industry is. The Agricultural Marketing Act 1929 was designed to help farmers by setting up the Federal Farm Board. The board then purchased agricultural surpluses, hoping to stabilize agricultural prices. The board created the Grain Stabilization Corporation and the Cotton Stabilization Corporation, which also purchased surpluses. And they failed because farmers just kept producing more of their crops. And so it exceeded the budget the board had. The Holly Smoot Tariff in 1930 was intended to be a mild tariff. But after several revisions, uh, Congress attacked on a number of things. It actually raised the tariff to 60%. It was the highest uh, peacetime protective tariff in U.S. history. The tariff just deepened the depression that already began uh, and, and actually helped to spread it to a global issue. All right, so I'm sure you've heard of Black Tuesday before, October 29th, 1929, the day the market crashed, where millions of stocks were being sold in a panic. By the end of the year, the pageant said $40 billion were lost by stockholders, uh, and in a short amount of time, millions will be unemployed, thousands of banks will be closing. Really, this is a catalyst for the Great Depression. It doesn't necessarily cause a Great Depression, but you can see crowds of people on Wall Street. I would imagine it was pretty insane to be there uh, and, and paranoid and just general panic. Still not as crazy as, say, Target on Black Friday. Obviously, we've talked about panics this year already, and we can tie that to um, overspeculation, which we're going to do here as well. But we should also specifically mention overproduction as a major cause of depression. And I, I love this line from the pageant where it said, the nation's ability to produce goods had outrun its capacity to consume or to pay for them. And so folks are making these huge investments in industry, and they're using credit to leverage those investments. They're buying stock on margin with the assumption that that stock will continue to rise. It was a bull market, right? Obviously, that's not going to be the case after 1929, and therefore, we have a problem. The problem is that we've just been relying too heavily on credit, and there's really no way to pay it off when those debts are called in, so to say. 
There's also a major drought uh, in the 1930s, which will cause a lot of farmers to be forced off their land or forced to sell their land as they can't produce any crops. Keep in mind that crop prices were going down anyhow, but if your farm turns to sand and blows away, you've had other problems to think about. All right, so here here begins the bashing of Herbert Hoover, right? Again, as a Republican who favors this traditional or even modified laissez-faire style economics, he doesn't really think the federal government should do anything. This is all part of the natural business cycle, and the ship will write itself. And so he initially calls for rugged individualism uh, for Americans. And obviously that's not going to work. He does develop this trickle-down style program of assistance, and what he wanted to do was – give railroads and banks and other rural credit corporations money so they can therefore create opportunities for individuals. And so he's, he's criticized because people say he's giving government money to big business, the same folks who caused the problem to begin with and not giving aid directly to the people. Again, people really began to blame Hoover as this man in the picture here shows. He's got his pockets turned out. He's recalled Hoover flags, a way to show everybody that you didn't like Hoover and that you didn't have any money. And again, folks are living in these Hoover Vills. I think we looked at a picture in the previous chapter. But again, you know, Hoover's poor farm, tobacco, fun, hard times are still hoovering over us. Poor kids. All right, so major public works projects are a foundation or a cornerstone of the New Deal. Uh, but again, Herbert Hoover is using the same kind of approach prior to that, and so you could say that he's sort of laying the foundation for that. Again, we don't really think of him that way usually. Uh, he did convince Congress to allocate two and a quarter billion dollars for public works, the biggest one of which was the Hoover Dam. He vetoed other projects that he viewed as socialistic. The Muscle Shoals bill uh, would have created a federal um, organization to create electricity by damming rivers in Tennessee and then selling that to the people directly. Again, FDR does this under the New Deal. It's called the Tennessee Valley Authority. 1932, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was funded, and it lent money to insurance companies, banks, agricultural organizations, railroads, and state and local governments. Again, sort of trying to get commerce moving again, provide funding at that level as opposed to directly to individuals. Also, the Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act 1932 outlawed anti-union contracts, these yellow dog contracts, and it barred federal courts from stopping strikes, boycotts, and peaceful picketing. Here's a shot of the Hoover Dam. I always think of National Lampoon's Vegas Vacation when I see this great scene in the movie. You could Google that if you have some free time. Those World War I veterans we talked about will march outside the Capitol and demand immediate payment of the bonus they were offered under the Adjusted Compensation Act. This is 1932. is right before the election. And what happens is they refuse to leave after they're asked to. So Hoover sends out troops and they use tear gas and bayonets to drive them off. And one baby actually died as well. This crushed whatever popularity he had left. And they are the bonus army. Now, while this is happening, the Japanese are expanding into the Pacific and directly challenging the League of Nations, uh, which we will see does absolutely nothing in response. Uh, they had invaded Manchuria in 1931, which is a section of China. I'll show you a map in a second here. The following year, the Stimson Doctrine is issued, which basically says that the United States would not recognize any territory that was acquired by force. Japan ignored this and then took Shanghai. Here's a map of some of that Japanese expansion. We'll look at this again when we get into World War II in the upcoming chapters here. But you can see Manchuria. Hoover does try to improve relations with Latin America in withdrawing those troops we referenced before from Haiti and Nicaragua. And he also, in doing that, is laying the groundwork for Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, which we'll see in the upcoming chapter. That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching Chapter 32, The Politics of Boom and Bust. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, um, or you could ask me next week in class. Take care.